Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We're going to begin with Kim Kalunian's question from WPRI. Governor, can you share what the state models show in terms of deaths? Yeah. So the blue line that had been on the screen is approximately 2,000 deaths, and that would be through until October. And the red line is just above 4,000 deaths, same time period through October. So again, social distancing makes a difference. It's, it's real lives, and that's why it's so important that we continue to do what we're doing. Richard Asanoff of Convergence RI asks, have you been in contact with community development corporations such as One Neighborhood Builders and West Elmwood to ask what their most critical economic needs are during this pandemic for the vulnerable neighborhoods they serve? Yeah, we have been. Uh, you know, if you have particular concerns, Richard, please reach out to us, reach out to my office, reach out to Commerce. Uh, Commerce is the group that's been in touch with them. but. As I've said so many times, the people bearing the brunt of this are those who are already in a very vulnerable position, and we are trying every day to provide housing support, food support, health care support, uh, support with utilities. But if you have, if you know of people who you feel um, are being left out, then please reach out to us. Steve Clampkin from WPRO asks, Governor Andrew Cuomo mm -hmm. has extended New York shutdown to May 15th in coordination with other states. Is Rhode Island one of those states? Are you going to extend the closures until May 15th? Mm, I don't know yet, Steve. As I just explained, every day we get more information. Uh, so it's until May 8th now. And as we get closer to May 8th, I'll make another decision. Eli Sherman asks, Rhode Island has among the highest deaths per capita in the country, number eight, including D.C. as of yesterday. Can you speak to why that rate is relatively high here, and is there anything that could change in the state's response strategy to help save more lives? Thank you for that question. Uh, the governor touched on this. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, some of the challenges that we have as, as a state here in Rhode Island, many of our unfortunate deaths um, have occurred in our senior population. And as we've been sharing, many of them have occurred in our congregate care settings, in particular uh, nursing homes. We certainly are um, one of the states that have higher rates of people who are seniors and that contributes. And then we also have a dense population. So we've talked about the fact that uh, a higher proportion of the population being seniors, being medically fragile, physically fragile, and being in our congregate care settings can unfortunately contribute to why we are seeing the types of fatalities that we are seeing. It's why I'll be sharing some of the aggressive measures that we are taking with nursing homes uh, tomorrow. And it's why we want to continue to support our congregate care setting communities, uh, knowing that this is a challenging situation. It's important for the staff who are out there every day making sure to take care of those residents. And we'll continue doing what we can to stem the tide and con to continue to uh, work closely with that community. And perhaps you'll both have a response to Nancy Thomas's question from Rhode Island News Today. Were you surprised to hear Rhode Island mentioned at the national news conference? And what is your reaction? It sounds like they are very concerned about our state. How did we come to Dr. Burke's level of concern? Well, I really credit the governor on this. Um, it's a reflection of what she's saying when we're talking to federal leaders, um, working globally to put Rhode Island where we need to be to best position ourselves. Um, she was able to uh, set up a conversation that I was able to have with Dr. Burks uh, yesterday, uh, talking about what our Rhode Island needs are, what we can uh, do to be most aggressive and to continue to keep us in the forefront of our response. And she acknowledged the tremendous work that's going on here and the, the density of our population and how that adds a level of challenge to what we uh, need to do. 
So uh, that message is known. Rhode Island is where we need to be, and we're all going to continue to um, be on the front lines in um, this response, a big part of which does connect to you being able to continue to follow the stay-at-home orders so that we can continue to go along the trend that we need to to have the best response. I want to add to that. So thank you for the question. I'll, I'll add on to that. Uh, I'm not entirely surprised. As Dr. Burke said, Rhode Island is uh, nestled between uh, Boston and New York City and Connecticut. Boston and New York City, of course, are hot spots, and they are, as far as we can tell, ahead of us on the curve. So we are still climbing. Our peak is a few weeks away. They're closer to it. Um, so it's, it's not at all a surprise that we would be uh, following them and that we would be experiencing something similar since we're in the same region. I will say, let's remember, though, that we're testing two to three times as many people per capita as Massachusetts and Connecticut. So some of the reflection of the increase in our cases is due to the fact that we're just doing a lot more testing per million people, uh, which is a good thing. I want to thank Dr. Burks. Uh, I, I brought some things to her attention recently. We were struggling to get a hold of some of the test kits and reagents that we needed. Uh, she was responsive. She talked to Dr. Alexander Scott. So uh, it hasn't always been easy to get everything that we've needed, and it's still not, but she was on it, and she's appropriately focused on Rhode Island because we are in a region that's getting hit especially hard. The next question is for the doctor from Alan Gerberti of WBOB. How long is COVID-19 transmissible in the body after someone passes away? And is this a potential health risk for medical examiners and funeral home workers? Thank you for that question. It is something that we are still learning in terms of the transmissibility in someone who has unfortunately passed away. Um, but we are working closely with uh, funeral homes as well as certainly our medical examiner team who's doing amazing work um, under the Rhode Island Department of Health to make sure that they have the personal protective equipment uh, that's needed based on the evidence that we have of what's the best approach uh, for being able to make sure that those staff as well as the funeral uh, home workers have the protection that they need. That's definitely a priority for us, as it is for having the healthcare workers have the PPE they need as well. Thank you. The next question, Governor. Christian Winthrop from the Newport Buzz asks, Newport is renowned for its many large world-class festivals, regattas, and events during the summer. Have you communicated any directives to these event organizi organizers? And what advice do you have for those who are booking travel and making plans yeah. to attend? Uh, so it's a good question. It's a difficult question. Uh, I, of course, we are in touch with uh, hospitality Association and, and organizers of large events. I don't yet have any guidance. I will say a few things. Some of it depends on, um, this, is, this is still very fluid, so it's, it's, it's two months ago we didn't even know about this virus at, or weren't experiencing it here. And, you know, we're still in April, so it is hard to predict with accuracy where we'll be in July. Uh, it also depends on where we are as a nation with respect to a treatment. If we're much further along with effective treatments, then, then that would also impact our decisions. Having said all of that, from where I sit today and in my conversations with other governors, mayors, the Trump administration, it's hard to see how we would be able to allow large concerts, large gatherings um, of the kind that you refer to. So uh, it, we're going to be at this business of some level of social distancing for many months. And so gatherings of the kind who, that rely upon a thousand people all coming together in close proximity, um, it'll be hard. And if they happen, and I hope some do, it'll be under very different regulations with many fewer people and it'll, it'll be a very different kind of event. So 
short story is we need a little more time to plan, but those are the sorts of events that are going to be the last thing to come back online. Governor Matt Allen has a two-part question for you. If the models are imperfect, to what degree do you use them when making decisions regarding public policy? Has there ever been an instance where you've decided to ignore the models when making a decision? If so, what was it? Mm. No, I, I can't think of a time when I haven't done uh, what Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott and her team and other experts recommend. I haven't, uh, and, I, and I won't. You have to rely, just because the models are imperfect doesn't mean that they're wholly inaccurate. As I've said, they're directionally correct, and what we do is we update them constantly. You get more information, you update them. You get better information, you update them. You have to, you, none of the decisions we're making, any of us, is perfect, uh, which is why you have to make mistakes, be flexible, and readjust. Do the best you can with the information you have at that point in time. The fact of the matter is you need to prepare for the worst case scenario. And in this case, the worst case scenario is a situation where you have a healthcare system totally overwhelmed. Not enough hospital beds, not enough ventilators, not enough doctors and nurses, not enough critical PPE. And so you have to have some sense of what's the worst, when could it be, and what do I need to do to get everything in place so it's never that bad? And I would say, as it relates to that, we're in pretty good shape right now, but we can't take our foot off the gas. We cannot take our foot off the gas in readying the system for that kind of a spike, and the public cannot take their foot off the gas in terms of staying at home, wearing masks, washing hands, keeping your contact log, um, we are very much still in the soup on this. We are very much still in the thick of it. And so just hunker down now and we'll keep preparing. And at some point, um, I hope that I know that that'll be a lot better. Thank you. Tara Granahan has a question for Dr. Alexander Scott. If a person tests positive for COVID-19 and sent home to recover, what's the follow-up as to whether they live with elderly relatives or someone immunocompromised? Yeah, so we have an army of people now that I want to give credit to at the Rhode Island Department of Health and those who have uh, jumped in to support who do a very thorough case investigation process. When there is someone who is positive, uh, the, an extensive discussion occurs about where that person can isolate themselves most safely. We've shared before that isolation means someone who has symptoms is able to keep themselves protected from being able to spread those symptoms from anyone around them. Certainly if you're sick, that's why you need to stay home because otherwise uh, the symptoms would um, be brought out into public and um, would be a concern. But we also talk about how to isolate yourselves when you're home and there are other people who are living in the household. When that discussion occurs, there is particular attention uh, placed on whether or not the other people in the household are high risk individuals, such as someone who is elderly or someone who has underlying medical conditions, including an immunocompromised condition where their immune system may not be as strong. Those situations are handled on a case-by-case -case basis, and we may need to at some times see if that individual who has symptoms can stay someplace else safely or see if the other members of the household who are at higher risk can stay someplace else safely. And then we shared uh, yesterday, the governor talked a little bit about what the quarantine and isolation uh, work stream, the team of people focusing that on that is doing, and some of the resources there also allow us to be able to make sure that if someone uh, has COVID-19 and is recovering, anyone who is at high risk uh, that's in close contact with them is protected in the most appropriate way possible. Thank you. Our last question today is from Amanda Pitts from ABC6 News. And Governor, this is for you. What restrictions do you see being implemented at restaurants, workplaces, and other public spaces as the economy opens up? It's an excellent question, and it's something that we're spending an awful lot of time on now trying to figure out. And that is also the 
the work around which I'm collaborating most closely with other states because um, you know, we share many large employers with Massachusetts and Connecticut, and it's important that we get coordinated. So I don't know yet, but it will be things like um, uh, regular schedules of sanitation, fewer number of people allowed in restaurants at any one time, changes to the way we, we work in shifts so that uh, you, can, you are exposed to the same people um, on a regular basis, not different groups of people every day. Uh, continued wearing of masks. You can imagine uh, temperature checking before you go into any place, any public place or any workplace. So uh, things of that kind that are designed to allow us to work and go to the park and go to a restaurant and reopen our economy and get our hair cut and do what we want to do, but safely, and by safely, it's a combination of more cleaning, more sanitizing, and continued social distancing. Until we have a, a treatment and a vaccine, we are unfortunately always going to be exposed to the reality of another spike. And by the way, you see that in other countries that either opened too quickly or uh, opened and then everybody you know, flooded back and they went right back up the ramp again and they had to shut down. So we certainly don't want that to happen. So we're gonna have to come out with restrictions industry by industry. What we require restaurants to do will be different than manufacturers, will be different than a law office, but it'll be of the kind that I described. So thank you, have a thank good you. day.